Hello and good morning friends, welcome to this EC Edisit live lecture. Dear friends, we are pleased to announce that we are on the verge of completing our series on history of English literature uh, as we uh, try to give you information that uh, on which lecture we are going to talk today. First of all, I would like to tell you all that this is the 22nd lecture in the series uh, and uh, today we would be talking on the vogue of uh, Pound and Elliot. And under this uh, very topic, we would be talking on two halves. That is, in the first session, we would be discussing on the modernist mode in poetry, whereas in the second half, we would be discussing on technique must transcend all. Dear friends, once again, I would like to tell you all that we have with us in our studios, Professor Bhim Singh Dahiya. Professor Bhim Singh Dahiya is a senior academician, author and a guide. He has students worldwide and his numerous books are popular among the students as well as the various people. So, dear friends, let's welcome our guest, Professor Bhim Singh Dahiya, under whose able guidance we would be discussing on the book of Pound and Eliot. Hello sir, welcome to the Edusat lecture. Thank you. Well, in this lecture we will discuss the modernist uh, movement in poetry as it was uh, spearheaded by Pound and Eliot. Of course, they were not uh, the only ones. In fact, they come at the later stage. The movement as such was initiated by other poets, theorists, practitioners. That was in the early 20th century, in the very first decade, 1909. There was a group of expatriates in Paris. They were natives of America mostly. But then they were living in Paris by choice because they thought their own country was not prepared for the new things, radical things in literature. And their own, you see, writers and readers, they were hung up with their narrow concern with themselves, the American history, American literature, American poetry, everything American, nothing beyond. Now, the group I am talking about, uh, they were the modernists and internationalists. They would hate to be identified with any nation. So, intellectuals, independent intellectuals who would value inventions in arts. And Paris at that time was the center for new arts in Europe, just as Florence or Rome used to be the center in the 19th century. In the 20th, the headquarters shifted to Paris. So all those who considered themselves new artists, they would shift to Paris and settle there. Among these was Ezra Pound, the most dominant one. He was an American. So was T.S. Eliot. But T.S. Eliot, by choice, made England his home. 
because he thought his own country was not really cultured enough to appreciate what he wanted to do. As for Ezra Pound, he was rather uh, self-opinionated, very arrogant, very confident in himself, and he thought that his own country was barbarous. He uses this word in his own poem that America is barbarous, has no civilization worth the name. And therefore, he decides to migrate to Paris, which he thought was the center of culture and arts in the 20th century. Besides Pound and Eliot, there were others. In fact, uh, it were these others I am going to talk about who initiated a new movement in poetry called Des Imagist, which is in French. In English, it will be the Imagists. So the movement is that of Imagism. So Imagism as a philosophy of art has its own rules which were framed by the pioneers, those who established this movement. The main and the earliest one was T. E. Hume, H. U. L. M. E. T. E. Hume. Hume strangely wrote only four poems, but he made a revolution because he is considered the pioneer of Imagism in English poetry. And he was doing that in reaction against the 19th century tradition of poetry, which was started by the Romantics and was continued by the Victorians, even the later Victorians, and then the post-Victorians, pre raphaelites and all. That tradition of poetry continued throughout the 19th century. So in the early years of 20th century comes T. E. Hume, makes a difference writes only four poems, but then he writes a sort of manifesto for imagism. And he says three things. One, direct treatment of the thing, whether subjective or objective, means you can choose any subject for your poem, for your poetry. It can be subjective, related to yourself, your life, your experience, your personality. It can also be objective about life in general, people in general, age in general general, so on and so forth. So they left it to the individual to choose his, her own subject to write about. So no condition there. 
the only condition is that the treatment of the subject should be direct no indirections no irrelevant things no preparations for coming to the point they'll say you directly come to the point say what you want to say and don't beat about the bush as they say in english and put your cards on the table say what you want to say and say it directly so that was the first principle of imagism which t e hume laid down the second was that you should not be using any word in your composition prose or poetry which does not contribute to the meaning of the poem or composition nothing ornamental because in the 19th century tradition there was much that was ornamental substantial thing was rather thin and it was the proliferation of ornamentation which made up the looks of the object the appearance of the object so there was always a gap between appearance and reality now these new poets and the leader t e hume he said there should not be any gap discrepancy between of what is being said the subject and the medium through which it is being said so no superfluous words no preparations nothing extra is to be said say it straight say it direct and say it to the point and nothing more nothing less this was the attitude so that is the second point or principle of imagism the third is that rhythm in the sequence of musical phrase the rhythm in writing it may be prose or verse that's not important but it should not be without rhythm so even the prose has to be rhythmic and rhythm has to be uh, in keeping with the musical phrase rhythm of the musical phrase so it is uh, not music which is imposed from outside it is not formally there and then you compose accordingly no forget about music when you are composing but what you are composing must have a music of its own so these were the three basic principles of imagism but then there is a question about the nomenclature itself the title why did they decide to call it imagism because their belief was that whatever you want to say must be said through an image a live 
image which should immediately speak to you as an experience of life that you have. So nothing abstract, nothing in the nature of an argument, a discussion, an intellectual debate, no. You speak through symbols, images. That was the emphasis of the images. Now T. E. Hume just did four poems and then he was no more. But then there were others. The most important was Harriet Munro. Harriet used to publish a journal called Poetry. The very title of the journal was Poetry. And what she was doing was to promote these imagists, the new poets writing in a particular style of imagism. So first of all, she published the complete work of T. E. Hume. Of course, complete work, as I said, included only four poems. But she published under this title in her journal, Poetry, and the complete poetry of T. E. Hume. Then, besides this, her own poems, and poems by certain other of the group, like Amy Lowell, Amy Lowell, Harriet Monroe, T. E. Hume. This constituted a group of poets uh, who came to be called imagists. And then Last of all and above them all comes Ezra Pound. He was the most aggressive of them all, most vocal, most confident, and a real leader of any movement. <coughs> by the way, he was an American by birth, but he was anti-American. He thought his country was culturally backward, didn't have a culture worth the name. So he called it semi-barbarous country and hence decided to quit, leave and settle in Paris, which he thought was the home for the artists. And it really was, not merely for poets, but for painters, for musicians, for sculptors, all sorts of artists. And it was a pleasure working there. They were learning from each other. <coughs> It was a collaborative effort to promote new arts. So very deliberately, they were departing from the established tradition of the 19th century and before that, the tradition that had come down from the Renaissance. So these writers, they were anti-Renaissance, strangely. They thought that Renaissance had disrupted the Christian civilization in Europe. 
it has not only disrupted, it has discontinued and destroyed and deflected the established tradition of Christianity. So they wanted to revive that tradition. To be against Renaissance means to be against science and to be against democracy. Because these were the two new forces that constituted the Renaissance, which was, in the true sense of the word, a modernist movement. But these people, imagine, Pound, could bully the whole world and got himself established as the modernist, although the fact of the matter is that he was a medievalist. Against all that was modern, science, democracy. And he was for medieval non-science or pre-science and orthodox Christianity. So in the name of modernism, he was actually reviving and selling, promoting orthodox Christianity and medieval poetry. So in the name of modernism, it is medievalism which is being sugar-coated and handed over to people as something new. It was not really new. It was only sugar-coated in another idiom which sounded very modern. But it was being misused to promote non-modern or anti-modern things. That is why Ezra Pound, when World War II came, he was living in Italy. From Paris, he had shifted to Italy. And there, he was on the side of Mussolini. You know, Hitler and Mussolini. These two dictators in Europe, one in Germany and the other in Italy. They on the one side and democratic forces on the other. America was for democracy. So was England and many other countries. So they combined and fought against these reactionary forces. That is what World War II was about. The dictators of the world on one side and democrats of the world on the other. So progressive writers, so many of them fought in the First World War, many of them got killed. In the Second World War also, in fact, uh, in Pound's poem, Cantos, the very first Sicanto is about these war poets, how they fought, how so many of them sacrificed their lives. And then those who survived, how they contributed to the furthering of the cause of arts. So Pound had that commitment. Unfortunately, 
uh, his politics was misplaced. It was on the side of anti-democratic forces. That's why when the war ended, World War II, in 1945, the Americans arrested him, although he was an American, but against America, fighting and promoting forces against his own nation, country, people. So they took him as a prisoner and took him to America. There in America, the fellow writers came to his rescue because the punishment could be death or life imprisonment at best. So progressive writers like Hemingway Robert Frost. These writers, they got together and met the President of India to rescue a great mind, but distracted into a wrong position. They succeeded to an extent. They could not got him liberated completely. But then the midway agreement was that all right, we don't make him a regular prisoner and we accept that he is mentally deranged and is not in sound mind and therefore cannot take proper decisions. Hence, he can be sent to a lunatic asylum and there he was sent. And there his story ended. As for Eliot, Eliot finally proved to be the greatest poet of the age. The modernist age. And in fact, modernist poetry is known as it was headed by T.S. Eliot, not Pound. Pound was a dictator otherwise, a leader. But as for poetry, the quality of it, the greatness of it, the credit goes to T.S. Eliot. He, you see, made it popular and established it as great poetry. Thank you. We stop here.
Well, these poets, uh, by choice and by conviction, and by pronouncement, they were technicians because they thought that the 19th century tradition of poetry started by the Romantics. That was not self-conscious enough and they didn't care much about the technical part of poetry, its prosody, its meters, its images, symbols, references, wit, so many things they ignored because they only thought that you give expression to what you feel. Well, it can give you personal satisfaction. It is unloading your emotions. But how about the readers for whom you are writing? You are not writing for your own uh, personal reading. If you do that, it's all right. But you are a public figure. You are a leader among people. They expect sort of guidance from you on life and so many aspects of life. So you can't be just giving expression to your emotions. It is not a personal letter that you are writing. Therefore, you must learn the technique, the trade that you are practicing. You must know the technical know-how. How else do you do that? They had a point. So, you find in Pound and Elliot that technical mastery of the prosody, of the various I see, aspects, technical aspects of poetry, not merely form, also meters, also music, rhythm rhyme, also images, symbols, metaphors, myths, all that. So they were really good at that. And they were good because they deliberately learned it, mastered it. And they were also conscious that they were launching a new movement and therefore the poetry that they were writing and promoting must be different from the traditional poetry. So that is why their slogan was don't retain anything of the traditional. Pound said, make it difficult, make it new. These were the two basic, essential requirements of new poetry. That the poetry of the 20th century, the new poetry of the new age, must be different from the traditional ones. And one way of making it different was that make it different from what has been going on. No traditional themes, no traditional style, no traditional form. So both in content in, and form a style and prosody in every department of the technical uh, construction of a poem, you have to be different. 
And since romantic tradition was a sort of soothing experience, that you read it for pleasure, as if it's a lullaby for the child to send you to sleep, to send you into a sort of reverie. They said, no, you have to be awakened to the harsh realities of life. Now we are in the 20th century, in an age which is a difficult age. And there are difficulties which are not merely physical, but also psychological. So externally as, as well as internally, the poet has to address the contemporary problems, the inner psyche of the 20th century man, modern man, and the external problems of the environment in which the individual has to exist. Well, in the modern condition, one of the key concepts that emerged was that individual in the modern age has become a non-entity, an anonymity. You are just one among millions. You are part of a crowd or crowds. So who knows who? No one knows anyone else. So this extreme form of individualism is the key to modernism. that every individual is different. You do not share anything with any other personality. This is another. One is that you are one among the crowd, therefore invisible. In fact, a black writer, Ralph Ellison. He wrote a novel with that title, Invisible Man. The whole point of the novel is that if you have to survive in the modern age, the only way to do that is to become invisible anonymous, unimportant. You should not be noticed by anyone. Because the moment you are noticed, you will be inviting trouble for one reason or another. Because the world has become so complicated, it is better to keep out of it. So you, you have no choice, you have to live within, but live within your own self. Don't try to get in touch, get in contact, to participate, to share anything with anyone else. I read out a few lines which will show you the difference between the romantic tradition of the 19th century and the modernist tradition of the 20th. Here is a description of evening from Wordsworth. There is a short poem called 
it's a beaut beauteous evening describing the evening and he says it's a beauteous evening calm and free beauteous evening calm and free the holy time is quiet as a nun the holy time of the evening is as quiet as a nun in the church she is all decoration she is all attraction but she is mom she wouldn't speak she would just be there so that is how evening is compared evening is understood in the romantic tradition it is a beauteous evening calm and free the holy time is quiet as a nun breathless with adoration just as the nun is breathless with adoration because ornamentation and requirement of the ritual not to speak but just to do the uh, gestures homage to the deity so it is to that image that evening is compared so wordsworth is describing the beauty the grandeur the quietness the calmness of the evening through the image of the nun but in modern poetry you see what happens t s eliot has a poem called love song of j alfred prufrock is the name j alfred prufrock and through dramatic monologue eliot gives him a song love song of j alfred prufrock and that's how it begins the opening lines of the poem let's go then you and i when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table imagine the first two lines arouse romantic expectation let's go then you and i the lovers going out together in the evening when the evening is spread out against the sky that time attractive time of the evening sun is setting you have that colorful evening so let's go out but then the last line gives you the jolt what kind of evening it is like a patient etherized upon a table patient etherized upon a table is the image of what image of death in life technically patient is alive but actually it is dead for all purposes for all practical purposes it's not alive it has been sterilized made uh, ineffective lifeless so that is the condition of the modern man patient like a patient etherized upon a table so death in life figure neither living nor dead but as good as dead so
So this kind of outlook on life was very radical and very negative also. That's why very soon in the 1930s, this was the movement of the 1920s, post-World War I, and it worked very well during that period. Because the post-war period of the 1920s was the period of disillusionment. War at that scale for the first time, in which the entire world was involved. That's why it came to be called World War. From one end of the world to another, west to east, north to south, all countries were involved in the business of killing, humans killing each other. Millions lost their lives. So, this gave the image of death in life that you are living technically, the modern man, but for all practical purposes, as good or bad as dead. Because you now cannot share your beliefs, your tensions, they're all your own. Until the end of the 19th century, there was a living tradition. There was some sort of community life. There was sharing of joy and sorrow. Hence, you were not alone. But now, you stand alone, you suffer alone, and there is no joy in life left, it is all suffering. And suffering too, in loneliness, in your own mind, is anguish, is internal. So that is how modern man is described in this poetry, love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, or the wasteland. So modern age as in the wasteland, <coughs> where nothing grows, nothing positive grows. So that is why the idea of anonymity, invisibility, and your being a loner, isolated individual, having no support or sharing from the community, that is what modern man is. So, Eliot and Pound, they were the pioneers in depicting the modern condition. That this is what the age is like, and this is what the modern man is like. And then, what kind of future is there for such an age and such an individual. So it has to be wasteland where nothing meaningful would grow. It, it has to remain a wasteland. So that is how these great minds viewed life in modern times. 
So far, so good. But the problem arises when you really go into their fundamental beliefs, political beliefs, social beliefs, cultural beliefs, even aesthetic, there you find they are not merely conservative, they are rabidly so. They are downright reactionaries against everything which is modern. Science and democracy, these are the two greatest assets of modern times. And they were against both. So what they were trying to promote was medievalism. But they were clever guys, smart guys, they knew that medievalism could not be sold, promoted in its original form. Because in modern times, nobody will buy it. Nobody would like to live like the medieval man did, just by faith alone doing all that the Bible tells you to do. Because there is so much else in modern life. Science, industry, democracy, they have transformed life altogether. So how can you continue to be reactionary? So they knew it. Elliot Pound both. Therefore, as clever guys, what they did was that they spoke the radical language of modernism. And they sold medievalism in the name of modernism. Sugar coated it. The content within The content within is medieval, orthodox, old, reactionary, but it is wrapped, it is packaged in ultra-modern fashion. So, people would buy it would accept it. And they succeeded so much so that they became the dominant figures in the whole of Europe during that period. Until the time the reaction came. And the reaction came only when the conditions changed. After all, nothing can remain unrelated to life. Finally, it is the life that defines everything within it. It may be arts, culture, whatever. So after the Wall Street crash of 1929, which was such a terrible crash that the entire Western world, the whole of Western Europe and America, you see, they became bankrupt. No jobs. And people starving, jobless, no work. So, Eastern Europe 
On the contrary, in contrast to this, remained unaffected. There, it was the other system, communist, after 1917, the October Revolution in Russia, they had different politics, different socio-political structure, governance. So then, after the 1929 crash of the Wall Street, the world changed. And now, even the rabid West got suddenly attracted to Marxism. Hence, 1930s, Auden Group rather than T.S. Eliot. So, T.S. Eliot discarded, Auden installed as the new leader in English poetry. Thank you, I think. With this note, thank you so very much for uh, giving us a very, very precious session once again. And uh, dear friends, uh, uh, we would like to tell you all that all the lectures uh, concerning to the series uh, History of uh, English Literature are uh, there for you on uh, YouTube. If you want to access uh, any of the lectures, uh, then uh, you can access these uh, lectures. Uh, and uh, afterwards, if you feel so that uh, uh, you need to get some uh, uh, query some questions to be answered then you can mail us at info.cc at the written ic dot in as well as if you have any kind of suggestions or if you feel that you need to get a, a, a very good elaboration on any of the topics you wanted then also you can give your feedback to us um, dear friends um, as we said that we are on the verge of uh, completing this um, series we have completed with the 22nd lectures lecture and uh, eight more lectures are remaining uh, in this series so we would like to tell you all that uh, tomorrow also we would be uh, meeting again and uh, would be uh, discussing on uh, another topic till then take care goodbye and have a nice day thank you sir thank you so very thank much you.